Please take a seat. You have. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome to St. Andrew's Cathedral. It's really lovely to have you with us uh, this morning, whether you're here in person or um, watching us online. Uh, it's really wonderful to meet together, to worship God in word, uh, in song, and in prayer. Um, a quick reminder, though, that if you are singing, we do still need you to be wearing masks, so please don't forget to pop your masks on when we come to sing. Uh, but as we begin, let's hear these words from Acts chapter 5. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Good morning. This cantata, which we're going to listen to and use as part of our meeting together this morning is based on a hymn by Martin Luther. He wrote the music and the words. Very talented man. Uh, we'd love you to join in with the chorale, which this whole thing is based on. You hear uh, snippets of this tune right the way through the rest of the music. We're going to have a go singing it now. The orchestra are going to play it, then the choir are going to sing it, and you're going to join in, if that's all right. So you may want to stand as the orchestra plays the introduction. And would you please join with me in the words of the general thanksgiving. So together, gracious God, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
We have come together to meet with God and to take our part in the building of his church. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Let's acknowledge our failure to serve him as he deserves and return to the Lord with repentance and faith, praying together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning's first reading is written by King Solomon and comes from Proverbs 4, verse 1 to verse 14. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender, and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honour you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. 
Listen, my son. Accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament Bible reading is from Acts chapter 5. You can find it printed in the outline if you have one. Beginning at verse 12. The apostles formed many, performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. 
No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, the Judas appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, Leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
My name is uh, Rob Smith. It's my pleasure to be your preacher this morning and to look with you at the second of our Bible readings from Acts chapter 5. It's printed inside the service booklet, which I'm sure you noticed. There is a brief outline of the sermon on the page following, which may also be of help. We've been sitting down for quite a while, and I wonder whether you'd like to stand as I lead us in prayer, and then we'll sit again after that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, the freedom we have to read it and to listen to it this morning, and we pray that you might teach us through it, make us wise and make us strong, so that we might give honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us and lives and reigns at your right hand even now as we are here this morning. And so we commit ourselves to you in his name and ask that you might help us and honour him for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. It was the British statesman and uh, philosopher Edmund Burke who famously said, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. And of course he was right. You know, if we don't learn the lessons of the past, then we are certainly going to re repeat the mistakes of the past, the mistakes of our ancestors. I take it that's why at the beginning of Acts chapter 5 we have the episode of Ananias and Sapphira recorded for us. Uh, we are to learn from that. We are to be warned by that and not repeat their sins and follies. But of course, thankfully, not everything that took place in the past, not everything recorded for us, is, uh, as it were, a description of error. Uh, there is indeed much that is good. It's why the book of Acts indeed has been given to us, that we might learn positively from those who've gone before us, that we might be encouraged by the boldness of God's servants, strengthened by the witness of their faithfulness. And that's what we're going to see in the passage uh, that we've just had read for us. I seem to be disappearing from the sound, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me up the back? Yes, good, we're coming through. All right, we have much to learn from this passage as we have things to imitate from what we see. Now, let me just say one other thing before we dive into the details. As we think about learning from the book of Acts, we need to recognize that there are certain aspects of the history that's recorded for us here uh, that are unique. There are things that are quite clearly unrepeatable. Uh, the book, of, of course, is called the Acts of the Apostles, and for good reason. The apostles were that select group of disciples who were chosen by Jesus to be with Jesus, as we're told in the opening chapter of the book, uh, right from the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry right through to the day when Jesus was taken from them, ascended up into heaven. And so we shouldn't be surprised that there's something unique about the apostles and something special about what God is doing with them and through them. They do things that the rest of the church didn't do. They were called to do things the rest of the church wasn't called to do. And so 
we just need to be careful that we don't just read something the apostles did and assume that that's what we must do or that that's what God, God is going to do with us. We need to be alert to the difference, as many have put it, between description and prescription, right? What is told to us and what we are told to do. So what we're about to see is that there is much here that's instructive and we just need to be sensitive to work out then what is of that description, prescription for us. Now, I raise this because it's actually immediately relevant as we come to the passage. Verse 12 tells us the very opening scene, as it were, of what we're given here, that the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And if you wonder what that entailed, well, verses 15 and 16 expand on it, don't they? As a result, we're told, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, this, of course, is not the first time in the book of Acts that we're told of these extraordinary things that God was doing through the apostles, literally here, by the hands of the apostles. Uh, We read about similar things at the end of chapter 2. In chapter 3, we're told of the healing of the the lame beggar at the the temple gate. Uh, In chapter 4, we have a record of the church's prayer when they ask that the apostles might be strengthened and made bold as God stretches out his hand to perform signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. And so that's exactly what we see happening here. In fact, it's a a regular accompaniment of the apostles' ministry, these signs and wonders and miraculous events. But all of it begs the question, what was their purpose? What was God's intention in doing these things through their hands? And the answer we discover is fairly straightforward. These are acts of what you might call divine confirmation. Right? They are confirming not just the unique authority given to the apostles, but the authenticity of their message, the truthfulness of the gospel that they are preaching. Now, that's clear at a number of points in the book of Acts, but let me just take you to somewhere outside the book of Acts for a moment, to the book of Hebrews, where in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, we read these words, that this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that God doesn't intervene miraculously anymore. I'm not saying he doesn't answer our prayers for healing today. In fact, I have no doubt that he does, as he sees fit, when he sees fit, how he sees fit. But there's a very good reason why we don't often see the kinds of things described here, why he doesn't do the signs and wonders now as he did them then. And that very good reason is because the eyewitness testimony given by the apostles, which these, the apostles, which these signs and wonders confirmed, has been confirmed. But that job is done. It doesn't need to keep being confirmed. Indeed, it can't keep being confirmed because the apostles are no longer with us. They've long since gone to glory. And so our calling then, as we think through into what is the, as it were, prescription that arises from this description, our calling is not to do and repeat the things that they uniquely were enabled by God to do, but to preach the message which has been given to all, is indeed for the whole world. That message which Hebrews says was first announced by the Lord and then confirmed to us by those who heard him. That is the message that needs to be carried forth and indeed is carried forth. That's why in verse 14 of our passage, As the apostles continue to preach that message, more and more men and women, we're told, believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Okay, so that's the opening scene that we're given here in this remarkable account. As we move into the second scene, we quickly discover not everybody's happy about what's happening. Not everybody thinks the good news is good news. In fact, the leaders of the Jews, as verse 17 says, were filled with jealousy. 
And so what do they do? Well, they arrest the apostles. We're not sure whether they arrested the, the, the whole 12 or some of them. Peter and John were arrested previously, maybe others this time also. But whatever the case, they put them in prison. But then God, yet again, intervenes. Does something extraordinary. Right? He sends an angel to open the doors of the prison, to bring them out of the prison. And in verse 20, give them this instruction. He says, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. Get on with the business. Go and preach this new life. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I find that a very uh, helpful expression. Certainly a good reminder to me that the heart of the Christian gospel is, in fact, a message of life. New life. Eternal life. Life to the full. Life forever, life that's been made possible by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus himself, the one who Peter calls in Acts 3, the author of life. Right? He's the one who's come to give his life as a ransom for us and for our sins that we might then be given life through him. Yes, this is a message of life, new life, eternal life. And just as receiving this new life is the greatest gift that you and I could ever possibly receive, likewise, sharing the message of this new life is the greatest gift that we can ever possibly give. Well, we'll come back to that thought yet. But the apostles, of course, they do what they've been told to do. They get on with the task. They go off to the temple and they take up their ministry of preaching the good news of new life in Christ. But of course, the authorities are blissfully unaware of this. They think they're still in prison. And so they get something of a shock, don't they, when uh, they ask to have them brought before them. And, well, the officers uh, go to the jail and then look at verse 23 again. They say, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. So not surprisingly, verse 24 says they were at a loss. But not, not for long, because verse 25 says somebody turns up from the, uh, yeah, who's clearly aware of what's going on outside their situation and says, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. And so the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. But look at the end of verse 26. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Clearly the people were welcoming this news of new life and perhaps not altogether happy that those who were preaching it were being once again prevented from doing so. But all of that brings us to the third scene of the passage because here again the apostles are before the Sanhedrin being interrogated by the Jewish high priest. What does he say to them? He says, well, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name and that is indeed true. Back in chapter 4, verse 18, we're told that they had charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But what had they done? Well, as the high priest goes on, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now, just think about that for a moment. Is that what the apostles were doing? making them guilty of Jesus' blood? No. They were already guilty of Jesus' blood. They were simply pointing out the truth, and they certainly had pointed it out. I mean, previously, when they'd come before the same council and had been asked to explain how the lame beggar had been healed, well, Peter said very clearly, there back in chapter 4, verse 10, by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. <laughs> but God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. And so they were guilty. Now, not only they. As chapter 4 tells us, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were all complicit but they indeed were guilty. 
and they needed to repent. But instead, of course, they ordered the apostles not to preach, but preach they had, and that's why they say again what they said in the previous chapter, we must obey God rather than human beings. You can tell us to shut up, but God has told us to speak. So speak we must. Now, as Kanishka mentioned a few weeks ago when we first considered this response from the apostles, uh, the Bible is very clear that our, our, what you might call, default posture towards governing authorities of any and every stripe ought to be one of obedience, submission, right? Peter says as much in his first letter. Let me read you from 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Or as Paul says in Romans 13, submit yourselves to the governing authorities. That's the starting point. But the Bible also makes very clear that there's a cutoff point, that there's a limit, a limit to the authority of every human institution and a limit to the obedience that we owe them. And that limit is reached when they command something that God has forbidden or forbid something that God has commanded. At that point, they've crossed the line. At that point, we must obey God rather than human beings. Now, as you may well be aware, this is a live issue for many, not just in the world at present, but in our own country at present, particularly in the state of Victoria. The Victorian Parliament has recently passed a bill. It's called the Change or Suppression Conversion Practices Prohibition Bill 2020, a bill that makes it unlawful for any person, be they a parent or a pastor or a teacher or a counselor or just a friend, any person, to provide any assistance or encouragement to anyone of any age to obey the Bible's teaching regarding sexuality and gender. It doesn't matter if the person requests the assistance, if they beg for the help, if you provide it, you have acted unlawfully and may well be prosecuted criminally. Now, quite understandably, this has got many people worried, not just in Victoria, but because the legislation has the ability to reach outside of the state and others in other states want to see similar leg legislation passed. And we have reason to be worried. This is not a good sign. But we shouldn't be surprised. It's not as if we couldn't have seen this coming. It's not as if the church hasn't been here before. The church was, in fact, born into a climate of similar hostility. This, in fact, is situation normal in many parts of the world and has been at many points in history. And so God's people have been here many, many times before. And we need to learn from them. I was particularly encouraged to uh, read the response of Dr. Peter Barnes, who's the uh, moderator general of the Presbyterian Church of Australia. Uh, he wrote in response to the passing of this bill, he said, what is the church to do? Well, he said, two things come immediately to mind. First, the apostle considered himself innocent of the blood of all because he proclaimed the whole counsel of God. We are obliged before God to preach all that he has revealed to us, whether law or gospel and to do so in a spirit of love and truth. Second, he said, there is nothing unique to such legislation. When King Darius succeeded his God-given authority, Daniel, we're told, did as he had done previously. He just got on. It is our task to keep on keeping on, to proclaim and live out so far as we can the gospel of Christ, which has been entrusted to us. That is a good response. That is the right response. And that, of course, is what the apostles did. And in fact, they did it right then and there. Have a look at verse 30 and hear their boldness. 
They continue, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. But God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Well, there is boldness to imitate. Now, when we come to the fourth scene, well, you won't really be surprised, will you, that the Jewish ruling council are so furious that they want to put the apostles to death. But, humanly speaking, there's a surprising and unexpected intervention from one of the members of the council. He's a high-profile Pharisee. His name is Gamaliel. We don't know much about him, although we do discover later on in the book of Acts that Saul of Tarsus, known to us, of course, as the Apostle Paul, had, as it were, studied at his feet. He was his mentor. Now, we don't have time to go through Gamaliel's speech to the council, but look at the advice he gives in verses 38 and 39. That's the key. He says, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. That's a very wise response. Not just because, of course, it's often wise to wait to see how things turn out, but because he sees the issues. If this is from God and you are going to pick a fight with God, you will not win. But of course, many have criticized Gamaliel as not going far enough, and certainly he doesn't go far enough. He doesn't push to the real question, which is the truth question. Is what the apostles, is what the apostles are saying true, is the question he should have been asking, and perhaps was asking, but didn't raise, because that is the issue. Now, the council knew the miracles had happened. They couldn't deny them. They'd seen the lame beggar with their own eyes. And so they'd seen the divine confirmation that God had provided for the apostolic witness. So why did Gamaliel not push them to that point? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We'll find out one day, of course. Perhaps he was on the edge of believing himself. Perhaps he saw this as the best way to save the apostles uh, without pressing his luck further than he thought possible. Whatever the case, God uses his speech, rescues and preserves his spokesman. And so in the final scene, the authorities call them back in. They have them flogged. Right? This is 39 lashes we're talking about. And then order them again not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. And if you didn't know the story and hadn't heard the reading, you might think, well, I wonder how they responded to all that. Did they leave shattered, broken, bruised, and bloodied? tail between their legs, afraid now to continue on with the work God had given them. No. Look at 40, verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, friends, that is the task that God has given to his church of proclaiming that good news that Jesus is the Messiah. It's the task that must go on, indeed does go on, right? Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, century by century. The task of bearing witness to the Savior of the world, the author of new life, Jesus Christ. Now, it's rarely been a popular task in the eyes of the world, at least. And it's becoming an increasingly difficult task here in Australia. You know, in my lifetime, we, you know, we've gone as Christians from being you know, respected to tolerated to despised. That's kind of been the shift, a 180-degree shift. 
Right? We were once, I guess, seen as on the right side of history. Now we're very much on the wrong side of history. And on that note, I want to commend a little book to you. It's a book that's just come out by Stephen McAlpine, an Australian author. It's called Being the Bad Guys, How to Live for Jesus in a World that Says You Shouldn't. It costs about $15. Kanishka tells me we're going to get a stack of them in. It only takes you two or three hours to read. It's worth reading. It's easy reading, but it's very, very helpful reading. Let me just give you a snippet from the introduction. Stephen McAlpine says, being on the wrong side is tiring and demoralizing. It makes us feel defeated or angry. But I'm not going to tell you how to stop being one of the bad guys, because the only way to stop being a bad guy in the eyes of the world is to become what the world says is a good guy. And right now, that means compromising in all kinds of areas where the world beckons one way and the Bible points another. So this book, he says, isn't about how to stop being the bad guys. It's about how to be the bad guys. It's about how to be the best bad guy you can be. To refuse to be surprised, confused, despairing, and mad about it. And to find a way to be calm, clear-sighted, confident, even joyful in it. Get a copy. What are we to learn from this part of the book of Acts? Well, I think there are three things. I've embedded them in the title, which is there particularly for those who love their alliteration. Three words, persecution, preser preservation, and perseverance. Right? We are to expect persecution. It's part of the package. Right? Jesus is clear about that. The apostles are clear about that. It's not the exception. It's the rule. It's the norm. But we can be confident of God's preservation, however that may come, right? Miraculous escape from prison or a speech from someone who's perhaps sitting on the fence, however it might come. God will preserve his church. He's committed to building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. The gospel will go forward. And so we need to adopt a posture of perseverance. Not the gritted teeth sort, although sometimes there may be a place for that. But no, as we've seen here in the passage, and as Steve McAlpine encourages us, joyful perseverance, confident perseverance, counting it a privilege whenever we are called upon to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Because a privilege it is. For friends, this is the way the mission goes forward. This is the way the gospel advances. This is the way that faithful witness is born, through this mixture, strange mixture of persecution, preservation, and perseverance. This is what, to what we have been called as we faithfully proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And we can do it without fear. Let me conclude with some words from the famous church father, Tertullian, who was one of the great Christian defenders of the second century. He said this, Kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow, for the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church.
Please remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe about God and his love for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. now going to lead us in prayer and then we're going to join together in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Let me pray. Eternal God, shepherd of your people, we feel the fleeting passage of life and know how fragile our existence is on this tiny planet. We confess with the prophet Isaiah that all flesh is like grass and all its glory is like the flowers of the field, the grass wither and the flowers fall. Yet we also confess that the word of our God stands forever. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In our frailty, we pray that you would look, we would look to you alone, for you alone can provide comfort and sustain us. We commit to you this day our Wednesday night healing service, and we thank you that your gospel there is preached, your people edified, and the disheartened are strengthened. We pray for those attending the service who are hurting or lonely, through bereavement, divorce or abuse, and for those struggling with unhappiness in marriage or singleness. Where repentance is required, make us willing. Where reconciliation is needed, make us quick to forgive, as you in Christ have forgiven us. For Chris and the ministry team at the Healing Service, we pray that you would sustain them and enable them to minister your gospel with a deep love and a compassion that comes from you. Have mercy on us, O God, and hear our cries to you, our loving Father, and lead us all as pilgrims through the darkest valley into the light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. God of nations who rules over all kingdoms, have mercy on our broken and divided world, shed abroad your peace in the hearts of all men, and banish from them the spirit that makes for war, that all races and people may learn to live as members of one family in obedience to your laws. We commit to you this day the people of Myanmar, 
Father, in the midst of unrest, provide protection for the vulnerable, the aged, the children. Mercifully guard those who are without a voice. Strengthen your church in Myanmar and give your children wisdom and discernment on how to minister in their current context. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Lord God, you are our eternal shepherd and guide. In your mercy, grant your church in this diocese, a shepherd after your own heart, who will walk in your ways and with loving care watch over your people, that your name be glorified. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Would you please remain standing for the benediction? May the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 